when the history books are written, 2023 will be remembered as the year that the world's largest asset manager entered the Bitcoin space. But not all Bitcoiners think this is a good thing. Some Bitcoiners have even gone as far to say that BlackRock's Bitcoin ETF could potentially open up an attack vector on Bitcoin in the future. These same Bitcoiners are claiming that a crucial event happened while we were all distracted with Javier Millet's recent win of Argentina's national election. And now that we have over 50% of the global Bitcoin hash rate, KYC, and we have the third largest Bitcoin mining pool actively censoring transactions, is now the time that we really need to start worrying about Bitcoin's decentralization and security? So before we break down the critical recent development in the Bitcoin space, let's explain the three reasons for why some people in the Bitcoin space are very cautious about this BlackRock Bitcoin ETF and why some people even call it an attack on Bitcoin. So the first reason actually comes on page 24 of BlackRock's original Bitcoin ETF filing, and it comes in the form of this quote here. BlackRock claims that there is no guarantee that they will actually choose the most economic chain in a hypothetical scenario where the Bitcoin blockchain actually gets forked into two. Now, some people in the space are claiming that this is all above board. This is something that BlackRock has to do. They have to dot all their I's and cross all their T's. And this is just something that they had to include in the Bitcoin ETF filing. And sure, this is a possibility, but let's say the more skeptical Bitcoiners in the space are asking some very interesting questions surrounding this quote. Many of them are asking, why would BlackRock not choose the most economic fork of Bitcoin? This is a controversial topic because BlackRock is the world's most influential ESG investor. For the new people, ESG stands for Environmental, Social and Governance, and it essentially is a scoring system for how companies are scored and ranked based upon whether they are good for the environment or bad for the environment, society and governance. And many Bitcoin critics have called Bitcoin anti-ESG for a number of years because of the fact that Bitcoin is backed by proof of work mining. This is a very energy intensive process and many critics have claimed that Bitcoin is not an ESG asset. This probably isn't news to many of you guys watching this video. You would have been aware of the aggressive and constant media battles that Bitcoin has been engaged in for a number of years. Okay, Most recently, we had Ripple co-founder Chris Larson fund Greenpeace $5 million to spread a little bit of FUD surrounding Bitcoin's energy usage. They created this massive big skull and they drove it around New York City saying, look, Bitcoin is deaf. Bitcoin mining is destroying the environment. And, then, and we have other critics of Bitcoin's energy usage like Kevin O'Leary come out and say that he's not going to touch Chinese blood coins due to the fact that China uses a lot of coal energy to actually mine Bitcoin. This means over time, Jason, I'm speculating when I say this, that maybe the virgin coin with proof of where it was actually made is going to be more valuable than blood coin in China. How about that? And some of the BlackRock skeptical Bitcoiners out there are highlighting all of this and they're saying, look, we think it's interesting that BlackRock has a reputation for forcing change in the companies that they want to influence. Well, behaviors are going to have to change. And this is one thing we're, going to, we're asking companies. Uh, you have to force behaviors. And at BlackRock, we are forcing behaviors. You have to force behaviors. And if you don't force behaviors, whether it's gender or race, or just any way you want to say the composition of your team, you're going to be impacted. So that is the first reason for why some people are a little bit skeptical about BlackRock, okay? They're looking at Bitcoin's energy usage and they're looking at the fact that BlackRock's the world's largest ESG asset investor. Now let's move on to the second reason for why people are cautious about BlackRock. And that is the fact that they are buying a large amount of shares in the world's largest Bitcoin miners. So this is a great little chart that went a little bit viral earlier in the year. It was put together by the Bitcoin therapist and he shows what percentage of these mining companies does BlackRock directly own shares of. 
So these are the top five largest Bitcoin mining companies in the world. And BlackRock is a pretty big shareholder in a majority of these miners. And I'd like to point your attention to number two on that list. And that, of course, is Marathon Digital. Now, this is interesting because this actually relates to the third big concern that the BlackRock critics and skeptics have about Bitcoin. So for those new to the space and are unaware, OFAC stands for the Office of Foreign Assets Control. They are a US institution and they actually put sanctions against Bitcoin addresses that they believe are owned by people who they deem to be criminals and bad people. And Marathon said, yeah, you know what? All of those addresses owned by criminals, we're not going to actually mine those or include those into the blocks that we are mining. And you can see that in the Coinbase of the blocks that Marathon was mining, they were actually signaling. They were very proud of the fact that they were OFAC compliant. But this quickly failed and they very quickly reversed their decision to mine OFAC compliant blocks after all of the pushback they received from many of the Bitcoiners in the space. Now, this is related to what's just recently happened and what is causing some people to be very cautious and concerned about Bitcoin's decentralization moving forward. And that is the fact that the third largest Bitcoin mining pool in the world, F2 pool, has just started centering transactions. So this is a very big deal because Bitcoin is supposed to be uncensorable money. It's supposed to be money that anyone around the world can send to anyone else they want to send it to. And no government, no central bank can stop that transaction. And the fact that a mining pool with over 13% of the global Bitcoin hash rate just tried to recently censor transactions. Many people are looking at that and saying, hey, look, we need to be paying attention now. So a Bitcoin developer actually uncovered the fact that this mining pool was using some sort of filtering process to actually once again not include OFAC sanctioned Bitcoin addresses into the blocks that they were mining. And the co-founder of F2 Pool took to Twitter to talk about his concerns surrounding the situation. But this event and this attempted censorship on the Bitcoin network, like the Marathon censorship in 2021, was once again quickly revealed. Now, despite F2 Pool quickly reversing their decision to attempt to censor sanctioned Bitcoin addresses, I think this is still something we should be paying attention to. Even if one of these censorship regimes went on for a long amount of time, it's worth noting that even if you had a sanctioned Bitcoin address, it doesn't mean you necessarily can't transact on the Bitcoin network. Just because an F2 pool that has 13% of the global hash won't include your transaction into a block, all you would have to do is just simply wait for another mining pool to pick up your transaction and include it into a block. I think it's good to kind of dispel the FUD surrounding this recent development in the Bitcoin space, I think it's worth actually tackling each concern or issue that people have surrounding this BlackRock entrance into the Bitcoin space. So I think the biggest concern we should tackle is the fact that BlackRock is actually accumulating shares in many of the companies in the Bitcoin space. Now, many people would say this is concerning, look out. But again, it's very important to note that Bitcoin is not a proof of stake network, okay? It doesn't matter how much Bitcoin you own or it doesn't matter how many shares of some of the biggest Bitcoin companies you own, you can't necessarily influence or change the Bitcoin network like you could in a proof of stake network. I mean, sure, BlackRock could make suggestions to some of the companies who they own shares in, but you would have to do a whole lot of convincing to make these Bitcoin companies enforce a decision that's going to hurt their bottom line. Now, the next big concern that people are talking about right now is the possibility of a 51% attack in Bitcoin. Something else that recently happened this year is the fact that the world's two largest Bitcoin mining pools are now requiring their customers to actually provide KYC information. So the Foundry mining pool in the United States, which actually controls over 30% of the global hash, has come out and said that any miner pointing hash towards this pool is going to have to give up their KYC information. And Ant Pool, which is the Chinese-based Bitcoin mining pool, which controls over 20% of the global hash, has said the same thing. So this obviously has raised a lot of awareness surrounding some sort of potential attack on Bitcoin. 
So these events that have transpired have got a lot of people talking about Bitcoin mining. They're saying, look, it's not good that over 50% of the network is KYC'd in one way, shape or form. It's even gotten some people talking about the possibility of a 51% attack on Bitcoin. Now, I'm not a technical expert, but I'm going to defer to somebody who is a technical expert in the Bitcoin space. And let's listen to a short clip of Andreas Antonopoulos actually explaining to us why a 51% attack isn't the massive concern that many people make it out to be. Do you have any concerns about a large nation state that has um, interest in just actively destroying Bitcoin to make their own, you know, super rigs and uh, design chips and just throw hundreds of millions or billions of dollars to intentionally disrupt the blockchain? Yeah, I, I don't worry about that at all. Um, this cannot be done with Bitcoin anymore. This is something that can only be done with nascent altcoins. Uh, Bitcoin has achieved a, a level of computing that uh, no single nation state can, uh, can overthrow it through computation alone. Uh, the effort to do so would require a massive covert operation of chip fabrication, uh, then the coordinated assault that would give them dominance over the next block for 10 minutes until we kick those bastards off the network, uh, rework the protocol around them, they would be revealed, they would have lost a billion dollars doing this, and all they got to do was one double spend. <laughs> Now here's the thing. Long before we get to that point, they figure out that if they just let this stuff run, they can actually get some Bitcoin <laughs> as a reward because the incentive structure actually works. And so I'm not worried about that. And a lot of people are watching the blockchain. And as I said before, what are they going to do? So they take over and they fork the blockchain and they go somewhere. Right? They've created an alternative blockchain. Great. What are we going to do? Who's going to join the NSA blockchain? <laughs> Anybody want to jump on Fedcoin? <laughs> so we're all going to stay on the old fork. Difficulty will go down. It will get more profitable for the miners who stayed behind. And we'll carry on with our coin, and they can go mine whatever the hell they want on their alternative blockchain. They achieve nothing. They can't make protocol changes because, we, as I said, five constituencies in consensus, and it would take a billion dollars to pull the most ridiculous Keystone Cops failure in history. <laughs> Plus, this would actually require government that can do IT. <laughs> So Andreas provides a pretty comprehensive argument for why a 51% attack is not a big concern. So executing a 51% attack on Bitcoin is much harder than most people believe it is. Today, we've also talked about why BlackRock owning a large amount of shares in these Bitcoin companies also isn't as bad as many people are making it out to be. But something we haven't discussed today and something that is potentially a small risk to Bitcoin is what happens with all of these ETFs if they want to try to suppress the price of Bitcoin. This topic has been discussed at length recently after Willy Wu had some very interesting comments at a What Bitcoin Did event earlier this year in Australia. Yeah, there's two types of ways you can move the price of Bitcoin or any asset, right? One is like price discovery. I've got this asset. I think it's worth this. You're not going to pay for it. Then I'm not going to sell and it discovers, right? That's long term. This is how the market gets to its wisdom of the crowds to find what something's worth. And then there's short-term bullshit. Or, you know, like positive news comes out and it dumps, right? What, what happens in that is it's urgent sellers, urgent buyers. If it's urgently selling, it forces the price down, right? And so um, when we're talking about these paper instruments, they're all about short-term trading. So if I want to sell um, Bitcoins right now because I, w I just think it's going to go down or I want to force it to go down because I've got a lot of money and I can make it for go down, I will just sell down that derivative contract. I'll just sell and sell and sell. I'm like, how much can I sell? Uh, maybe 10 times more than the money I've got. Maybe I've got like um, $10 million. I can sell $100 million all within one hour, maybe in five minutes, and I can push that price down. And um, does that affect the real value of Bitcoin? Does it? Who thinks yes? Who thinks no? The answer is yes. <laughs> because, because there's this thing called an arbitrage trade, 
which is actually our business. Our business is make sure all the markets are equal. So if this paper contract is down here and Bitcoin's up here, sell the Bitcoin and buy the paper contract and they will close up. And while I do that, I, I earn a funding rate and, and the demand and supply from both markets will com converge. And um, guess which market is stronger, paper markets or the real market? It's the paper by a factor of 10 and maybe a factor of 100 in some markets. So if you control the paper market, you can push the price around anywhere and you can control that by having a bunch of money and you leverage it up and then there's a war going on from these guys playing the paper markets. And that's crazing this irrational price. Now, if you want to learn a little bit more about how governments and central banks all around the world could potentially be trying to suppress the price of Bitcoin through these paper ETFs, we recently recorded a video diving deep down this rabbit hole. If you want to watch that one, I'm going to pop a link on screen right there that's going to take you straight to that video. And with all that said, I hope you enjoyed this one. Let us know in the comments down below what you thought of it.